All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are so honored that each of you is here. Um, it's very meaningful to us as we celebrate Native American Heritage Month. This is a time when our center, and, and this year in um, collaboration with the Johns Hopkins Office of Multicultural Affairs, and really most importantly, our Native Circle Group, who is our faculty, student, and staff advocacy group throughout the university, representing indigenous uh, issues and very important things to um, our all peoples, um, has really been the driving force behind um, inviting Denisa Livingston here today. And you're in for such a treat. We just spent a little over an hour with Denisa, and she's a force. You can't, she's a public health force, so I can't wait for you to be able to experience her. Um, to get us started in a good way, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Gabriel Tayak who's a member of the Piscataway Nation from Southern Maryland and a national spokesperson for indigenous land and water rights, as well as the US government treaty compliance. She's a graduate of Cornell University with a PhD from Harvard. Dr. Tayak created a number of American Indian outreach groups through her work with Amnesty International, including the Indigenous Peoples Urgent Action Network. For 18 years, Dr. Tayek served as a staff historian at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, managing exhibits including the Native Landscape, Return to a Native Place, Algonquin Peoples of the Chesapeake, and the Indivisible African Native American Lives in the Americas. Today, Dr. Tayek dedicates her time to her research and cultural recovery along beautiful Nanjame, I hope I pronounced that right, Nanjame Creek, a 13-mile river that flows into the Potomac in Charles County, Maryland, while taking time to speak at events like the People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. We are so excited to have her back to do a formal land acknowledgement for all of us here today. Thank you. Well, a greeting and thanksgivings, and thank you for such a kind and thorough introduction. You know, it's always a little odd to hear yourself be described, and thank you for, for doing that. Denisa, welcome. Thank you for being here and for all of us on this, on this place and in this land and at this time that we all bring so many different strands and parts of our lives, the, bringing the scholarly, the personal, your emotional selves, and then the parts of you that put your feet upon this landscape, this landscape that looks so different than what it was and what it is and what it continually tries to be and remember itself to be. And I carried a, forward a, a lesson that I listened to recently in the past few years from a, a water walker named Sharon Day um, of the Anishinaabe people. And she did a water walk down the Potomac River, the full length of the Potomac. And she went to its source, to its purest place, and took that water and put it in a copper vessel and walked the entire length of the river that forms our homeland and our connection as Piscataway people, brought it out into the Chesapeake Bay and poured that water in where it becomes more salty and then it flows out into the Atlantic. And she said to it, for all that it had been through, all of the industrialization, the colonization, the enslavement of our African brothers and sisters, the genocide, the erasure, all of that that has been experienced, the, the, the violence, but also the persistence. And she poured that water out and she said to that water, remember who you are. And that's what we have at these moments, is memory and action. And what better to think of that um, than to think about food sovereignty? and the work that you're doing. So now to um, bring us to, to this place where we are on another river, but a river also that joins into the Chesapeake, which is called the Great Shellfish Bay or the Mother of Waters. And that 
is water that is connected to us. It has a little bit of salt in it, just like the blood in our veins. And so when you are here, you are part of that. You breathe air that contains the vapor from that water. And it goes into your body and it comes out. And if when you travel back home, wherever you're from, or if you're from here, you carry that and you share that. So that land acknowledgement is an exchange and continuous relationship. The word Baltimore, it comes from our colonizer, you know? So think about that as being put upon this land and think about something deeper because as we speak the words Baltimore, we also know that that is the person who received all of our lands on paper two years before anybody even got here in a, a two ships called the Ark and the Dove and then laid claim to our entire areas, all of our territories. So we know that we have layers. And when you do a land acknowledgement, it takes us through time and it also creates a relationship. It's not a token expression. It's not just something to say and then be done. So that while we're here, we create um, a relationship in this moment. It creates an awareness. And it also creates a responsibility. And there's also an accountability that you're engaged in now by learning more and by acting more and by studying and being and knowing more. So with that, I would like to give my thanks and gratitude as this, as this place starts to transfer from the plant world that's going to sleep now to the place of more um, animals and storytelling time we're still part of that cycle. The birds are still migrating on this river. It's still seeing incredible change and flow and tides. And so this story is not over and you're a part of it now as we're together in this room. Thank you very much. And thank you. I'm so looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Dyack. Um, it's now my honor to introduce Sean Ironmaker and his assistant, Sue Tai. Um, Sean is from the Ani, which is the White Clay Nation, and the Kota Nations. He'll be doing an opening song for us.
You know I'm here. Thank you so much, Sean and Sue, and thank you for standing. I neglected to say, please stand. This is an honor song that opens us to all the possibilities of this meeting. And so thank you, Sean, so much for opening us in that way. Um, it's now an amazing pleasure to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Victoria O'Keefe. Dr. O'Keefe joined our center just over two years ago. And in some ways, it feels like a really long time ago. And I say that because she jumped in with two feet. She's led so much at our center for it to grow, for it to be more connected to Native peoples across the United States, Indigenous peoples across the world. And um, she's introduced us to Dr. Tayek and to Sean. And um, her footprint is really growing within our center. And we're so very lucky. She's a psychologist. She comes from the Cherokee Nation and Seminole Nations of Oklahoma. She's working on some of the most important work of our center to reduce youth suicide prevention, but most specifically doing it from a strengths-based approach and really focusing on how we engage elders um, to carry this work forward. So Victoria, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you talk, to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Allison. Osio Nagata, Victoria O'Keefe, Dagwado'a, Chichiligi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2019 Native American Heritage Month event. This is sponsored by our center, the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health, as well as our amazing Native Circle group. And can we just have anyone who's part of Native Circle, can you stand for a moment? And can we just thank all of these amazing Native students? <laughs> scholars, faculty, staff. Thank you. And this event is also sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Office of Multicultural Affairs, so we're so happy to be here. The Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health was founded in 1991 and empowers tribal communities to take a leading role in designing public health programs to improve health and well-being. We currently collaborate with 140 tribal communities across 21 states. A few key facts about what these partnerships have achieved. Three of seven vaccines US children get in the first year of life were proven effective by our center in collaboration with tribal communities. We also work on serious behavioral and mental health inequities with programs rooted in indigenous ways of knowing. One of these programs is Family Spirit, the only evidence-based home visiting program designed for Native families. This program reaches families in over 125 communities across 20 states. With leadership from Indigenous faculty members, the center's training program focus on, focuses on public health through an Indigenous lens. Our training program has provided more than 1,700 scholarships to scholars representing more than 48 tribes. The program supports scholars across the academic pathway from high school through postdoctoral training and early career development. Today we're brought together for a topic focused on food sovereignty, such an important and vital topic. According to the National Congress of American Indians Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative, Food sovereignty is defined as the right and capacity of tribal nations and communities to one, freely develop and implement self-determined food sovereignty definitions. Two, to cultivate access and secure healthy, nutritious food that's produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and is key to practicing our tribal cultures. And three, to create and continue maintaining food systems that enact policies that advance tribal nations' priorities centered upon tribal citizens to thrive when it comes to physical, mental, social, and cultural health for today as well as for future generations. This indigenized system arms us with the ability to combat public health inequities impacting our communities, including lack of access to nutritious foods, obesity, and diabetes. From a strengths-based perspective, the powerful food sovereignty movement gets us back to relationships with food and the environment. These relationships our ancestors and our relatives knew so well and we aim to pass these teachings on to future generations. With that, I'd like to introduce Tara Madri of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Tara is one of our center's native scholars. She's an MSPH student in nutrition, and her focus is food sovereignty. 
Tara will introduce our keynote speaker, Denisa Livingston. Thank you. Make watch for that introduction, Victoria. I'm honored to introduce the noted food sovereignty activist, Denisa Livington of the Diné Community Advocacy Alliance, our keynote speaker today. Denisa, a member of the Diné Nation, is a food justice organizer with the Alliance and a Shoko Fellow, and she empowers community members to take control of food policy to promote local health solutions. She is shifting the focus from individual factors to systemic changes and the solution from personal choices to food sovereignty. She has built a process for rejecting unhealthy foods and promoting choices. First, by eliminating tax barriers that counterproductively favor junk foods over healthy ones. Second, by taking advantage of the Navajo fundamental laws where any Navajo citizen can propose legislation to build a community movement towards food sovereignty. And third, by building a system for local Navajo chapters to fund and launch health initiatives most relevant to them. Please join me in welcoming Denise Livingston. Good afternoon, everyone. It's another beautiful day to be indigenous. Hey. Good to see everybody, but the room's a little bit lopsided. More people on that side, come to this side. Well, good to see everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm gonna introduce myself um, in my language, in Diné. Yad e, she Denisa Livingston in the at the cheat in the to shit in the chin. Ose dena e tachi ni dasha che e don na nish eje tachi ni dasha nela. At a yi sedet na sha e teragon wul ye diya kut a diya an ishi la. I just introduced myself and dena. I'm Denisa Livingston. I came from the Navajo Nation, um, specifically the Four Corners area. For those of you that are familiar with the Shiprock area, um, I'm from an area there called Fruitland. My mother is from um, behind the Shiprock Pinnacle at another rock um, we like to call places by the rocks. It's called Mitten Rock. And then my father is from the Zuni area and in a place called Bread Springs. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm of the Red House People Clan, and I have a sister here that is of um, the same clan, clan, Kitha Chitney. And um, yeah, and so it's good to be here. and. My story and what I bring to you today, I hope will bring you some insight, some understanding of the work that we have done. And it's been quite a journey to be through this work and go through this work. But I think even the personal journey here, um, as I traveled from the Four Corners area to Albuquerque to catch a flight on Southwest, I did a time lapse um, flying around the Sandia Turtle Mountain and around the area where my people in the 1850s were taken and were forced to walk on the long walk, Huilte. They walked over 500 miles to a place called Bosque Redondo in southern New Mexico. And flying over that route yesterday was quite emotional for me. As I looked at the desolate area, as I looked at this area that had canyons and mesas and mountains that they had to walk through that many people died on that route. But the good news is that as we are going higher and increasing in altitude, I remember that how many of our people returned back and survived. And we are always told that they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And as we began to hit the turbulence, as we began to climb in altitude, I became at peace, I became, you know, moved by what my grandmother was telling me and the stories as I took her to Bosque Redondo and she told me stories that she heard from her grandparents of salt, sugar, and flour being introduced in the diet there, that they've never seen those foods before, that their canned foods were introduced. And as they returned back home and as they signed the treaty, they were given rations to return back with and return to an area, a land that did not look like it was before. The vegetation, the plants, our plant relatives, our animal relatives, the land was changed, it was different. The life there had changed. They had to go back and revitalize and restore the land. And as I flew here to bring this 
information to hopefully inspire you all to share with you and, and to give you stories that are coming from home. I hope that it brings healing as well. And so thank you for inviting me today and thank you for the lunch that the students had. Um, we had some surprises, right? I brought some New Mexican food, some treats for you guys, and uh, we spent a wonderful time. But before I dive into the presentation, I'd like to show you a video. My name is Denise Livingston, and I am a community health advocate for the Diné Community Advocacy Alliance and we have been battling food justice for years now, addressing the inhumanity of food apartheid, addressing the suffering of our diabetes epidemic. We have grown to empower our community members advocating for health, advocating for change, advocating for the right to healthy food the right to access healthy food. And we've been working on several pieces of legislation that have been successful. First is the Healthy Diné Nation Act of 2014. The act itself is a 2% unhealthy foods tax. And the tax is an opportunity for all of our 110 Navajo chapters to utilize this revenue to empower the communities and this is an opportunity for community members to be involved to create healthy change, addressing the social and physical environment, whether that's through the built recreational environment, whether that's through instruction, whether that's through community food and water initiatives, um, recreational initiatives, and also health preparedness, and also an opportunity to match that to other opportunities, funding opportunities, grant opportunities um, that will support the change in the communities. As a former Navajo Nation Council delegate, I sponsored legislation uh, called the Healthy Nation Act. Uh, basically, that was to address the epidemic of diabetes and obesity among our Navajo people. It came to a point. It came to a point where I thought I had to set an example as a leader. So when I sponsored legislation, we got it passed. Um, I basically started running, started eating healthy, and just where I just lost a um, tremendous amount of weight where, you know, through running, through eating healthy, and uh, it just made me where, as a leader, I think I should set an example if I want to sponsor legislation, asking our people, our Navajo people, to, to uh, start eating healthy and be more physically active and uh, to address the epidemic of di diabetes and um, obesity. Okay, one of the things that the unhealthy Diné food tax has helped us fund is a gym. And one of the things we have incorporated into our gym is a kickboxing program. And I am a Taekwondo enthusiast. And as I had said earlier, that I had boxed in the Marine Corps. One of the things that we did is we've created um, this gym with the unhealthy Diné Food Tax Act. So here is one of the, I'd like to show you one of the programs that we have put in here and some of the messages that we have posted here to incorporate what we had spoken of and what we had incorporated is also messages on the wall as well. So the Healthy Diné Nation Act can help support the youth through funding of fitness centers, playgrounds, as well as um, creating opportunities for community members to participate in these activities. Okay, so here at Navajo Prep, we do have a health and wellness policy in place. And our health and wellness policy, it helps to support healthy eating and habits on our campus. And it helps to encourage students to make healthy choices when it comes to what they are putting into their bodies. 
And what I most enjoyed, I remember the first time Navajo Prep hosted a Zumba event in conjunction with DCAA, our custodian, Virginia, she got in there. She took a break from cleaning up and she jumped in the back row and she was in there and she was moving and she was really enjoying herself. And that was really awesome to see because like her, she's an elder on our campus and our kids respect her. And when they saw her out there, they were like, Virginia's out there, let's go. And at the next event, she was telling them, I went, I did it, now you go too. And that was really neat because it does help to reinforce what we're trying to do and to have her presence there. It really helped to encourage and motivate other students to be there the next time we held it. A healthy Diné nation means to me um, the overall health of everybody. And I feel like it's not, it doesn't only apply to food, which is obviously a really big concern on the reservation, but I also think that it's the mental and sort of the emotional well-being of the, of the body. And I think that when I came to school, I learned a lot more about that. And just in my home in general, I learned about the traditional way of how Hojong, you're supposed to be spiritually and physically well, and I think that's what a healthy dinner nation means to me. University. Um, my part with the health and wellness was I did a presentation on power dancing throughout the Navajo Nation to different youth. What we did is um, me and a couple other of my friends were all power dancers, and so I brought them along kind of as entertainment and kind of as to show them like, if you're healthy, then this is one way that you can stay healthy is by dancing. We also did um, a presentation talking about health and wellness among Native youth, saying how like unhealthy people are nowadays, and how that um, and how we have strayed from our traditional foods. And thank you. Uh, I come here a lot for the skate park. Uh, it's full of Diné children, so I like to, you know, it's my closest community. Even though this isn't a reservation, but you know. A lot of Diné kids live here, so I like to just help everyone out as much as I can. Because I bring like a jug of water, and we all just kind of like, you know, take waterfalls. And you know, just supporting one another. Uh, the lifestyle of eh, the meaning of, you know, just everyone coming together and helping when you can. Um, yeah, this is a good environment though. Uh, it's good to enrich yourself with the teachings from your elders, you know. Uh, I like that a lot. I, I respect the elders' teaching, so I always try to put that into my well-being and how I talk to people and communicate. <laughs> All right, just doing a nice simple climb for the day. This is how I really get my workout in, and I think most importantly, this works out my mind and my body. I am the coordinator of outdoor recreation here at San Juan College. And this is our climbing wall, and this is what we come to do when we want to get engaged and break ourselves away from the reality of the world and step up to meet new challenges as well as break barriers and set new challenges for ourselves. And you know, this is a great way that I work out, that, that I have fun. My experiences with the Dinette Community Advocacy Alliance are, have, have had a real impact on my life and have geared me to, again, go back to college and. To, to, to want to get a degree in health promotions or health and wellness and be a part of the team. And it, it, it's, it's the interaction that I get, but also the engagement that comes from the Advocacy Alliance that allows us to get out and to promote what we do, to in, encourage people to be healthy, but also drive the importance of not only this generation, but the next generation. And We've decided as a couple to change our lifestyle, to better ourselves, and hoping that others will follow us and that we'll be the shadow for them to see what we've progressed in our life and that maybe not all, but some will look at up to us and follow us and begin to make the right decisions. All of our advocates in this video have demonstrated that there is intergenerational synergy that we've been able to create something that has never been created before to empower one another, to support one another, to respect one another. And this empowerment has strengthened us. We've been able to experience and address these challenges together, but also to celebrate the successes of it. And you have seen, you have heard, 
through their experience, their knowledge of wisdom, their passion, their joy, their creativity, and also their gratitude. That those are all the elements of human beings being on fire for healthy change. Support the healthy the nation. Hashtag healthy the nation. Support a healthy Dene nation. Support a healthy Dene nation. <laughs> And I'm asking you to make a call of action and get into a life and support the healthy Dene Nation. Did you all learn a word in there? How do you say healthy food? <laughs> that, that means healthy food. So leave from this place and say Well, it's been an incredible um, journey, as you can see some, from some of our advocates um, and our allies in there, that it's been uh, community-based work and I'm a community member, and despite my bio, I am now going by the title of ancestor. So as we dive into this work, we used to look back and say that we are dis the descendants of our ancestors, but now we have to look forward and say that we're the ancestors of our descendants, that we have to be in this place and space, and as the people that spoke and also thank you for sharing thank you for the land acknowledgement and for everyone here Allison thank you you know that we together are looking forward and in, in your work doing work that's going to not impact the generations now but the future generations and so as I tell you a little bit of background about what we've done and what we're going to be doing it's it's quite emotional because it is hard work I went to graduate school and in graduate school, I did not learn how to write an unhealthy foods tax. There was no template about how to do this work, about how to in critically engage the community members, and all these different questions about how do you deal with tribal council, and especially the difficult ones. Um, you don't learn those things in graduate school or in public health school. And so it's been a learning process. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate um, to be here. And this word here, um, it says, let's live a long life. Um, in DCAA, we are a grassroots organization, and this is something that we stand on is, shana dani glingo as deto. And if you want to repeat it, you can, but if you don't, it's fine, because as difficult as it is to say, it's just as difficult to implement. So it's always a reminder that when we're saying, let's live a long life, we're reminded how difficult and how challenging um, and also how joyful it can be to do this work. And the work we've done, um, these are really the major things that we focus on um, to empower our community members to be a part of writing legislation, introducing legislation, and creating change in policies that we've never explored, that other nations may have tried to explore, but still to this day, we are the only unhealthy foods tax in the US. And so this is something that is critical to understand the narrative that goes out normally does not um, pinpoint and highlight what is being done in Indian country and in indigenous nations. And so um, it is very important to know that we are using our, our ancestral knowledge and wisdom and elevating our community members to be a part of this process um, as we create new roles for society, getting the youth involved, getting the elders involved, getting folks that ordinary would not be in hard 
critical work in, in, in this arena that they're now being a part of that. And so as you've seen in the video, it's taking everybody to create change. And part of that process is really this diagram that we've used for a long time when we first started this work, um, this work dates back to 2011, and going before our Navajo Nation Tribal Council, going before our tribal leaders and our elders, and even for us to, to learn and to uncover and reclaim our participation as community members, as tribal citizens, that community members are at the core, we're at the center of all of these different areas. And this is one thing, um, some folks may understand some, you know, it's new and, and as a tribal um, elected leader, we've heard back that they never knew the importance of community members in this aspect. Um, and, and so as we find our community members and activate their purpose and, and help them to understand their purpose, you know, it is really empowering for us to create this work and, and to accomplish what, we've, what we have been able to do. So part of the story, and over lunch, we, we got to ask some questions and learn about the background of what we've been doing and learning um, about working with um, one of the Navajo Prep Natani Youth Council, which is the Youth Leadership Council, and training them and activating their roles in our work. It's become important how this has resonated through the challenges, has been, has been resonated through grandmas and also um, through the people that you've heard in the video that when it comes to policy and legislative changes, ordinarily community members are not informed how to do it, when to do it, the process of doing it, but we've been able to create this, um, this avenue where folks are now realizing that they um, can be activated, that can, when we're talking about community currencies, we're talking about how do we scale with integrity? How do we scale knowing that every community member has a purpose and, and also that they have resources, a skill, a talent, expertise that can be elevated, that can be scaled, that can be used? And we've learned in the process as we have retirees, we have statisticians, former um, council members, and also students and people from abroad that are in own indigenous, are Diné people that are stepping in to provide and to be help, helping the initiative that together we're able to create this change. And so these are really the four areas that we've been able to target. Every policy, every law has a story behind it. Um, it took us about a good three tries to, to succeed. And that went through also a presidential veto. Um, we went back to override a presidential veto the second time. The third time um, is when um, the first one passed. Um, in the override of the presidential veto, the second one passed, and then the other two followed. And so this has been really a big effort. The Healthy Dinner Nation Act, is over a 300 page piece of legislation. Um, it is no joke <laughs> when you're talking about doing an unhealthy foods tax. It, it, it involves everyone to be able to create something in this manner. The tax free healthy food law is really emphasizing the Diné and indigenous foods. And so, what, what was happening on Navajo is that. We were being taxed and um, at the border towns, um, at the neighboring towns, food, healthy food was tax free. And so we, we decided that it, it was critical that we needed to eliminate tax. And so what we're trying to do is promote um, our own foods, whether you know that's the white corn, the juniper ash, the blue corn, um, pasoli, dry hominy, indigenous foods, Southwest foods, chilies, um, really trying to activate that environment so that our people will be able to buy tax-free healthy food. The unhealthy foods tax, and in the media, it is mostly known as the junk food tax. Some of you have probably heard that, and, and also um, some some folks have also called us the FBI, the fry bread investigators. <laughs> We've been called all kinds of names. But um, you'll never hear us say the junk food tax unless it's a reference to. Um, and the reason is that we, we decided that, you know, we, we cannot promote the words junk food because there's junk and there's food. And the very specific thing is that this word, unquote, unquote, junk food, never existed in our diet. Therefore, it never existed in our language. 
So as we are on six radio stations, writing in entirely in the net, talking about healthy food and unhealthy food, we also had to find that word and make the word, create the word with our community members. And the word there that you see in bold is Ion Bajol. Ion means food, but Bajol means the scraps, the oppressive food, the prison food, the fast casual food, the unhealthy food, the food that contaminates us, the food that contaminates our food system, the food that never existed in our diet, the food that came at Bosque Redondo, the food that my relatives went from Bosque Redondo back to their home, the food that still exists in our stores, in our C stores, in our retail stores, that are dominating the stores at home, and even down to the, the local retailers that are carrying unhealthy food. That's Ion Bajol. And as you start to create that list, it gives you the chills because it is something that is causing um, diseases, it's causing families to suffer, it's causing my people to receive amputations, and I'm going through this process. I've been through that process with family members, and every Navajo family, every Diné family is, is affected. And so we're very passionate when it comes to this because food is very spiritual to us. Food is who we are, food is what we are, food is where we're going, food is how we've come this far. And it's very holy and we have to keep it that way, we have to respect it that way. And so Ion Bajol is a term that we're educating our communities with. But also question, what is Ion Bajol in your language? Every one of us here, um, a story that came to me just recently is, is that someone you know, was getting into this food sovereignty trend, right? They're like, oh, I want to know about food sovereignty. And, you know, like it's one term that defines everything, right? And, um, and non-Indigenous people come up to us and, and ask us, you know, um, I want to know about your foods. I want to know about um, chilchin, which is the sumac, the three-leaf sumac. I want to know about your foods. And um, a friend of mine told the woman, she said, why don't you go back and learn about your first foods? Let's all learn about our first foods. Let's all learn about where we come from. Let's all learn about you know, where our grandmas went, where, what our grandmas traveled through, what our grandmas experience is. And it's very true, and it really helps us to define, and if we could all do that, maybe we can make an impact on global climate change. Maybe we can make an impact you know, in our own communities and, and the work that we're doing, and also to activate our purpose even greater. And so with this unhealthy food tax, it became the Healthy Dine Nation Act of 2014. And the Healthy Dine Nation Act was known as the junk food tax. We removed the words junk food from the original legislation because at that time, the words junk food did not have a scientific definition. We had to define that as well. We had to define every category of unhealthy food. So we have a tax almost on everything because 99% of our food is unhealthy. And this too is addressing food apartheid. It's addressing that word food desert, right? But we stopped to use that because it's food apartheid. A desert is an ecosystem. And here, 99% of our food is unhealthy. And so this Healthy Dine Nation Act um, is raising revenue. And at the end of the fiscal year 2018, that's how much revenue we've been able to generate at at least half compliance. Since 2014, this is a lot of money. And so in the policies, we also had to define how this money would be used and who would be using it. In the policy, we have 110 Navajo chapters that can utilize and access these funds to create community wellness projects. They can use it to, to um, built recreational environment to address the social and physical environment. They can use it for exercise equipment, to maintain current projects, to build community gardens, farmers markets, use horse therapy. They can have Zumba events, traditional cooking classes, um, traditional craft classes. Um, we've been doing the data collection in the past week on the current projects, and we've seen all these different activities activated. So whether it's weaving, bead making, in our traditional shade house is called um, Chao'o. And so that Chao'o is being created at, at these chapters um, for the parks. Um, they've been creating hogans, our traditional home, um, and creating these spaces and places that they've never had 
in their communities. And so as you go across Navajo, you will see um, basketball courts, volleyball courts um, rising up and being built and in construction. And you just see the change of the conversations happening too. That at Tribal Council, this has always been debated. It's one of the hottest topics. Um, as, as you probably heard, the recent news on Navajo, President uh, um, Nez had banned candy from the, the fair, the Navajo Nation fairs that we have. It's something that is always debated or um, the taxation part of it, that taxation maybe was never part of our culture, but we have been standing our ground and, and really um, advocating for our ancestral ways and, and traditions and practices to be activated. And we found out that taxation is a part of our culture, that historically our elders were you know, um, taxing themselves, and we've heard these stories that you know they tax themselves for survival, to be able to, that, to be able to stand here and say that we're still here, that they tax themselves in those situations. And so as taxation became our focus, it was something that also other people did not know about taxation. And so many debates came about about this conversation, um, what is involved in, in the Healthy Dinner Nation Act, but the really purpose of it was to recycle that money, that currency, that was being spent on unhealthy food to, to repurpose that and to create community wellness projects. So the policies focus strictly on that. We give them a guideline of what the project should be, but they're the ultimate creators. We tell them, activate your creativity, um, be creative, you know, find projects, do projects that uh, we've never had before, and this is just the general list of what you could do. So it's really a dream opportunity for anyone to be involved. The part of the Healthy Dine Nation Act also is that any community member can be involved. You don't have to be Diné. So if you're there working you know, for a government agency or a part of the community, um, establishing the definition of what is a community member, that they're able to step in and be a part of using those funds. And so if you guys have ideas, I'm sure everybody has a Diné friend. You can say, I have this idea for my Diné friend. Send this information and say, let's do a project together. Um, some of the areas are doing some intertribal work. Um, one chapter, Red Rock, uh, Hard Rock chapter, excuse me, is doing work with the Hopi permaculture um, 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 group and, and policy efforts that they're incorporating there. And so there's a lot of different things happening. And this is something that is really exciting to see because we never thought this would be the outcome. When we're talking about the, the process of, of what happens when a, a consumer pays the tax, these are the critical elements of what happens from the tax to get to the community-based wellness projects. So we've been advocating on every level, whether it's at the legislative level, the executive branch, or the Navajo Nation Tax uh, Office of the Tax Commission, uh, Division of Community Development. Uh, we've been working with all different types of um, um, agencies so that we can make this work. The critical part, the challenging part, is looking at our activity as community members. In the beginning, we weren't very well accepted at the council chamber um, because we are community members. We didn't have a title. We didn't have an official title. We um, were not working for the tribe. All different types of um, views that we had as community members and authoring legislation and stepping into a ground in a space that ordinarily is held by elected leaders. And so we uncovered the fundamental law of our people, the traditional laws, that we held our leaders accountable and responsible, that we became activated as community members to be a part of driving change and creating change. And so even in this, our own people um, were hired by industries um, to campaign on behalf of unhealthy food, and uh, money was channeled you know, to, through our communities, and even to this day are in our communities trying to recruit our young people to be a part of their leadership schools. And so as we're in a fight you know, against um, unhealthy food industries, we're also um, trying to address the addiction because not only are, are people addicted to unhealthy food and Ian Bajol, but also it's resonating, resonating all the way to the tribal council. So even our leaders too are addicted. And as you heard, Mr. Simpson, who was our legislative sponsor, he talked about his change, right? He talked about um, changing his habits, talking about doing Zumba. Um, we were the first group to do Zumba in front of the council chamber, believe it or not. 
And they're like, what is this club music? And it's like, oh, we're out there like, you know, moving. And um, the first time, it, it, it wasn't very well accepted. But we're like, this is healthy change. You know, it's, it's people smiling. It's creating that positive environment. By the third time, we had some of the council delegates um, out there dancing with us. And to this day, Mr. Simpson is still dancing with us. Don't tell him I told you, even though I know it's being recorded. <laughs> so Mr. Simpson, I meant to say that. <laughs> And so changing that environment, but really uh, helping our, our tribal leaders to understand um, and be reminded of this fundamental law. And it, it is very special and also spiritual to know that what we're doing is activating something that, that has been carried through the generations. Ancestral practice, the wisdom, the knowledge, um, the experiences, um, as we're calling out history, as we're redefining um, who we are, as we're reclaiming who we are. Because when we're stripped of our identity through food, that food is our identity, how can we as an indigenous people have agency? We have to be calling out unhealthy food. We have to be um, advocating even more than, than what we're doing right now. And that causes us to be in a space when we're uncomfortable because when we're so comfortable, then change does not happen there. We have to be uncomfortable. We have to be in these spaces where we're continuously learning and have those people around us that um, ask us, what is your dream? What are you working on? What, what, what are your visions? And tell you that that vision's not good enough. Because those are the kinds of people that, that I love to hang out with because they challenge you, say, dream bigger, dream larger. That's not good enough. Go higher. Our people and our grandmas and grandpas, they experienced so much, they went through so much, and they have experienced things that we'll never experience. Their level of suffering, the other day I was at IHS, and with those smiley faces, um, with the scale of pain, the nurse, you know, she was a graduate of Johns Hopkins, and she said, oh, you know, our elders and, and our ancestors, you know, their, their pain scale is different. Our one is not their one. And if their pain scale is different, their visions are different too. It's higher, they want us to achieve so much, they want us to do so much. And I encourage you, you know, to look at what you're doing and do what you need to do because we're all here, we're, we're gathering together. As indigenous people, we're organizing. The global climate change of indigenous people, the global climate change of who we are as organizers is that we have to organize better. Industries, they already know their plan. They already know their long-term plan. They already know how they're gonna influence. They already know their next commercial. They already know how they're gonna target market. They already know, you know all of these different practices. And they have the funding. When we come into solidarity, when we're talking about allyship, when we're talking about supporting one another, we have to know that health solidarity is intentional. We don't just step into the space together and say, oh, okay, we're allies. We have to build relationships. That everything w that we do is relational. And so in the video, the young person said, eh, that's a word, a term in Danette that we're all in relationship. And I wear this bracelet here, and it's from our, um, our neighboring tribes in the Arapaho, and it means that we're all in relation. That everything is relational. So folks ask us, what about municipalities? What about the taxes that happens in other um, places that are in non-indigenous settings? And how do, we build, how do we build community? How do we build trust? Because where I come from, data operates by the speed of trust. Everything goes by the speed of trust. And that's very important that our kinship system we're able to network, that it's already created the legacies that um, have been placed on the table, that we're able to practice sovereignty at the table, in our kitchen table, that if tribal council is not gonna do that, that we're gonna teach our people how to do it on the kitchen table. That when we lay those um, prophecies, that those prophecies that our elders taught us, that are now becoming active, that they're becoming real, those prophecies that, that we've heard long ago, that my mom, my grandmother, that they've heard when they were children, it's becoming real now, global climate change youth migration, rural migration. It gives me chills because we have to come, come out of our comfort zones. And so as we do this work, everything is relational and everything um, that we need to be doing, we, we have to 
we have to step into a space where it activates where we've been coming from and who our ancestors want us to be. As we're writing our language and as we're returning to um, our language uh, opportunities um, in the newsletters, I think it's outside on the table. Um, you can grab um, one of the newsletters that has um, our language revitalization. So what we're doing is we're, we're writing um, word puzzles in Diné, crossword puzzles, word searches, and it is difficult. If you guys are doing your MPH and PhDs, that's not difficult. <laughs> Diné, writing Diné and using uh, the, the health terms is very difficult. Um, and so I want you to um, take that home, do some homework, and for example, this one here is the word that I told you is um, So that means healthy food is life. So as we activate our own languages, as we learn about languages and how it's relational to the work that we're doing to public health, to food sovereignty, to the future uh, uh, of what we're creating for our um, descendants and future ancestors, when we're looking at all of the entirety of that, it's something that we become empowered by, that we become activated to, to teach other people and when we do this, we're activating the social gastronomy. The social gastronomy of that reactivation is connected to life. I recently watched a Bollywood movie called Zindagi. Dear Zindagi, who speaks Hindi here? What does Zindagi mean? Life. Yeah, life. Dear Zindagi with Shah Rukh Khan, okay, it says, Dear life, it's reconnecting with life. It's reconnecting with the purpose. It's reconnecting with who we are. We forget about now touching the ground. We forget about wearing our moccasins, right? Because when we wear these moccasins and when we, when we come out, our feet are nearest to the ground. There's nothing that separates the white shell and, and the earth here is, is the story of the moccasin. And as we come out, we're reconnecting. We're connecting with Zindigi. And it's something that is essential because if we do not have that contact every day, and some of you that follow me on social media, yesterday I posted my chestnut lima beans. And I was greeted by my chestnut lima beans as they keep giving and giving, and I've been growing different types of vegetation from all around the world, that they're giving and giving, that when we're doing our work, it's not about the kinship system only, it's also about growing plant-based organizations. One of the prophecies that we are told is that there was gonna be a web around the world. And now we have the World Wide Web. And in the World Wide Web is the process of being a plant-based organization because there are systems and organizations and allyship happening supporting one another, not this hierarchical system that we're so used to nowadays. So as we're building the plant-based systems and as we have the shared leadership structure of Diné Community Advocacy Alliance, it's something that causes us to think about a plant when it doesn't have a brain, but yet it, it has a way to survive. And as I seen the Christmas beans and the lima beans and also the ginger and, and the tomatoes and the chilies of all around the world that I'm growing, they find a way to survive. They find a way to support one another. They find a way to bless you. And yesterday on social media, I said, we got to be good at that. We have to be life givers. We have to be speaking truth. We have to be in not this safe space. A lot of people want to create a safe space, but we're trying to create a space that is different. It, we want to go beyond that. We want to create a brave space. Because in a safe place, you're trying to protect everybody. But in a brave space, you share truth, but you respect one another. That's what we're trying to activate at Diné Community Advocacy Alliance, that we're doing that through taste education. We learn how to taste foods. We learn about other foods. We're learning how to explore um, Zindagi and be a part of that conversation worldwide. Because it's just not us as Diné. It's, it's everyone here and all of you and where you come from. And in doing that, we've been doing a lot of um, campaigns. And it took one year, talk about hard work, one year to reclaim one billboard on Navajo. If tribal council, tribal politics is difficult, I mean, we called every number on those billboards, and if you drive across Navajo, um, on, uh, you see Monument Valley, you see these places be defined by these corporations, and it says, like, Windrock this way, and it has their symbol. We're trying to reclaim those billboards. 
We called every number. We called the tribal government. We were calling other people that knew about this billboard. Well, the only billboard that we got to get on was the only digital billboard in Chinle by IHS. And we had about over a thousand rotations a day. So this billboard was going, this digital rug was going round and round. You can see people um, driving by it. But talking about educating our youth, talking about educating our public, having an educated public to make the decisions for their families, for, for their youth, for their elders, it's going beyond just doing those policies and, and the presentations and also the campaigns. It's also doing Zumba. It's getting out there into community. And grandma, one of the grandmas told me, Denise, I would never come to a Zumba event because it's all club music. But I wanted to go because my grandson wanted to go. But it's also setting that environment that, that it's positive, it's, it's, it's alcohol and drug free, that you know, it's a space that people can come and laugh, that you know, to activate those endorphins. And we see a lot of that now happening and, and going across Navajo. And we'll be doing more Zumba events and doing taste educations. We, we, we like to taste food um, and have some healthy food served there and, and also some fruit infused drinks. And so Valerie Seagrass, um, our sister from the Northwest, you know, is doing a lot of indigenous drinks. And so you know, we're trying to incorporate those recipes and, and as well as with Mr. Simpson, doing different types of advocacy, not only on the laws, but also the vision about how do we influence um, and create indigenous public health systems. We did some work with U of A and creating some programs in that aspect, being an influence and an advisor in that. We need to have more programs like this. We need to teach our um, tribal citizens on how um, to look at research, how to do research, um, talking about data sovereignty and talking about how data travels at the speed of trust, how do we activate, how do we protect it, how do we do all of these different things together, not just in silos, but together. And the youth, they're very critical, important to our life ways. And we're teaching them to be a, light, a leader without a title. Because when it comes to that title, it really separates us. It really causes a division where I come from and being one with community, being a part of community. It is important to know, you know and to help them to understand because the youth have it really bad nowadays, right? I mean. When, I'm, when I look at growing up, I would not want to be growing up in what they have to go through nowadays. And it's a hard life for them, and they need a lot of encouragement, especially where I come from. They, they want to learn. They, they want to be a part of the work, and we have to do extra to, be, to, to ensure that they are brave, to, be, to ensure that they feel protected, that they feel inspired, that they feel uplifted. And so we do all kinds of crazy things on um, public health and in our uh, taste education. We bring some insects, some spiders. We're talking about the future of food, the wild edibles. We're talking about roots. We're talking about what is going to sustain us when we're talking about global climate change. And so when they come, they know that they're going to be doing something different. And it really helps them to understand you know, the complexity about public health. We have been doing all kinds of different um, advertisements with the youth and getting their message out there and we we didn't intentionally want to focus on the youth but because of the experience that we had with tribal leaders that would there was such a division between um, doing um, intergenerational work that we had to start bridging that we had to stand our ground and and continue to advocate in ways that that will activate these policies I was recently in Belize with our Mayan relatives and talking about taxation, it, 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 it's something that's not always supported, but when you begin to hear about you know, the stories about what we've been through in DCAA, it becomes more real and it becomes um, a place that, that you wanna have these discussions to be a part of. And in Belize, one of the schools that we went to, we went on a Friday and they had asked me to share um, the taxation um, with the students. And like, what are the students gonna, going to learn from the taxation? And we went there in, in this garb that we wear every day. And, the, and there they call it rags. They have uh, rag Fridays. And so we went there on rag Fridays. And what they do, they pay one shilling, which is tw 25 um, cents, one shilling. They pay one shilling to wear their rags. 
And so I paid um, four shillings because there were four of us, and I said, here's a donation because we're wearing our rags to your school on Friday. And what they decided is that that, that fundraising that they're doing um, before the fundraising, um, their restrooms were not being cleaned. They were not being maintained. Um, the students were getting sick. They were becoming ill. Um, and they decided, the students decided to tax themselves if they wear their rags, that they're going to create um, an income to, to sustain and also to maintain um, and, and have a clean, clean um, environment in the restrooms. And I said, you guys already got it down. There's nothing you need to learn from the Healthy Dinner Nation Act. And these are youth. They're, you know, four years old, five years old, six years old, and they're taxing themselves, and they understand completely how this you know, works, the shared investment and responsibility. And so that uh, it should beg the question about us, right, as indigenous people, and for you, where you come from, what are we teaching our youth, and how are we getting them involved? In the newsletters, we focus on the citizen journalism. It's important as indigenous people in reclaiming Native Truth, Truth Project. Um, this project was an unprecedented two year research on case studies on the misconceptions and views of indigenous people. And in that, we're talking about the narrative of indigenous people. We're talking about the ownership and the authorship of what is being told, what has been told, what has been um, kept, what have you learned, what were we taught and what is being exposed, whether that's in curriculum, whether that's in um, research, whether that's uh, in museums, whether that's in the media. And so what we're trying to activate is the, the citizen journalism, allowing our community members to tell their own stories, not go there and interview them and say, I want to know this information or I'm working on this research, really become one with community. Make everything relational and be a part of community. And so. These folks here, Darren was in um, from Shiprock, was in the Reebok Spartan race. Um, Sean, you've heard from. He has the um, corn skateboards, um, and then as well as Eudora Claw, who, who leads the Native Women Outdoors. Um, we feature different community members, and their stories resonate through those newsletters that we distribute through the Navajo Times, about 20,000 copies, and we're still doing print. Because when we're talking about justice, we're talking also about utilities justice. That there's a lack of broad broadband. You guys have 5G, we're at 1X. And so these different barriers and challenges and doing our work despite that, we're still continuing to, to do great work. Um, and so we're still doing print, so you guys get a copy of that. One of the real, really critical issues about our work is that we cannot have health without healing. I returned from one of my trips. Um, I'm a Slow Food International counselor, indigenous counselor of the Global North. I'm the first woman to be elected in this position. And I serve on a 40 member international council. So I do a lot of international travel within, uh, with our indigenous relatives from all around the world. Um, and in, in one of my travels, I return home. This is my grandmother. She's almost 90 years old. And she, she said, Chiege, which means a Navajo, and Navajo ladies, good to hear that, right? Shiyeje, um, here's the picture I drew. And I said, okay, Grandma, got my cell phone, took a shot of it, this was the only picture that I had, and returned days later um, with my mother and talking about these foods. Um, the picture on your left, Nano Yeshe, is a food that was created in her childhood days that they no longer create. And my mother never knew about these foods, and it is blue corn with goat's milk poured over hot coals without any cooking utensils, without any cookware. And they created sort of like a pancake. And she started to tell the stories about these and said, oh, Grandma, these are tamales. She's like, they look like tamales, but they're not tamales. And she had a different story about that. But what made me even more sad, what made me even more Emotional is that, why, do, why does my grandma and why do our grandparents, why do our elders, our moms have to wait till they're almost 90 years old to share the knowledge? That my grandma's almost 90 years old, that she finally felt safe to share these stories. There's a lot of knowledge and wisdom out there that we cannot find in textbooks. We have to make relationships. We have to go back and reclaim who we are and where we come from. 
the social gastronomy of what we're doing right now of our work of public health and, and what, what we want to be and who we need to be has to go back to this. And as we talk about trauma, as we talk about these different barriers and challenges in our communities, we should also ask the question, is it possible to return back to the way we were before trauma? Is it possible? And what would that look like? What would it look like if we could become who our ancestors were? If we could have the health and the capacity and the courage and the compassion? Remember, the treaties were made for friendship. They were made to become one with, with each other. They were made to, to be with one another, to be in relationship, to be in friendship with one, with one another. What are those things that we need to learn from our ancestors and our grandmas as we go home and as tonight as we're reflecting you know, about our work and grandma should not have to wait. And my grandma has been ill these past couple of days and I spent time with her before coming here and I said, Grandma, I'm going towards uh, Washington, which in Diné is Washington, D.C. And my grandma, she testified before Congress six times in her lifetime. And they drove here. We have resources, we have funding, we have things that, that our grandparents ever had that's easier for us to do work. And my grandfather, her husband, died from direct contamination of uranium. The U.S. government hired our own people, Navajo people, without any protective gear during the Cold War era. And my family has been a part of social justice since I can remember. It's not that we choose to go in public health. It's already been given to us. Our work is already here. It's already lined out. We just need to find those ways we need to talk with one another. We're just activating what our ancestors wanted us to do. When we talk about joy and justice, it's important to know that ancestral justice that we, need, we leave here in this space, in this place, knowing that we have each other, that I'm here, that you're here, that we can contact one another and, and be encouraging. And as my grandmother has been teaching us about Ian Yahats Egich, Ian Bajol, She's been the one, a, a driving force in even women in politics, women in the space, women in community advocacy, women activating community currencies and leveraging that. Because women, we have a different way of doing things. We're the mothers, we're the caretakers, we're the spiritual providers for everything, from the way that we plant the three sisters, the corn, the beans, the squash, that it has an embryo just like we do. That life is so precious. Life is something that we cannot take for granted as we activate our language and get to, to be one with that language and get to know where we come from and who we are, no matter where we come from. But everybody here has something to offer. Everyone has something to learn. That we also need to be, be mindful of the taste education. That as we raise our fork against, cut, raise our fork against climate change, excuse me, is that we also have to be mindful of what we're serving at our meetings, what we have at our desk, what we have in front of us, in front of our children, in front of our elders, and advocating for what is healthy. It is hard work because when someone in our family, for us, if someone in our family is diabetic, we're all diabetic. Because it's not like, oh, only, only they can eat this, they're diabetic, and, and separate them at the table. No, we all eat like we're diabetic. You'll hear my mother's story as she was diagnosed with diabetes. We became diabetic altogether. And in the end, we reversed it. The doctors told her it, it cannot be reversed. And that was the narrative that was given to our people, that it can't be reversed. That's not the truth, right? We can reverse it, and we did. She went back to her doctor and said, I, rever I think I reversed my diet, and they confirmed it. So as we activate this and become a part of this, follow us, the Slow Food Turtle Island Association is something that we created a couple years back with our um, elder mother, Winona LaDuke, and my sister here, Kaylina Bray. Um, we are part of this work, Elizabeth Hoover, Chef Sean Sherman, Chef Brian Yalzi, all those amazing people, um, Melissa Nelson, 
and Patty Martinson, Dan Cornelius, um, so many of our elders that are part of the Slow Food work um, and advocating for Turtle Island. In the international work that I do, Indigenous Terra Madre is, is very important as we step into the political work that as indigenous people, um, we can have the influence at these greater summits, at these international summits, that we can be the voice, that we can help to alter um, and influence policies and impact policies at that level. So follow us because we do have events. We just got back from Japan about three weeks ago. Um, it was the first time the Japanese government recognized our Ainu relatives as indigenous people in the northern island of Hokkaido. And so we met there with them and we had an event, an indigenous Terra Madre event, um, and sharing stories, talking about resources, talking about how uh, do we build capacity, how do we support one another on a global scale. scale. We had over 150 indigenous leaders from all around the world, Tajikistan, Iran, from Mexico, from Turtle Island, I mean, from Kenya, from all parts of the world that we united. And it's truly amazing to see all of the similarities, but also to acknowledge the, the capacities that we have and the differences that we have, um, and, and of course, the diversity. But it was extremely important to be there to see the Ainu grandma for the first time recognized by her government, that she stood there and imagine your whole life and not being recognized. There are a lot of our relatives and our beings that are not being recognized even to this day. And so get involved in our work um, here locally um, for Slow Food USA. We have created the EIJ Manifesto. And in part of this, I, I wanted to share just a few lines with you about how we're holding um, the organization and holding our work to know about how to make connections and also what are those protocols when when working with indigenous communities and indigenous people. And one of those things, of course, is the land acknowledgement. Like my sister said here, it's not just something that you pass through. It's something that is activated already in us. It's something that is always there, that should always be there. And so as we set the standard for all of you here, um, sorry that's supposed to um, say slowfood.com, you can also Google, ask Grandma Google because she knows <laughs> Slow Food International. Um, you can Google and as well as in International Terra Madre from Slow Food International. Uh, we have events coming up around the world uh, and you can follow us there. When we localize this work, we're doing taste education at home as well. So any of the events that we go to worldwide, we bring that back to our community and we have a free tasting. So we had a nine course Italian fusion Navajo and Diné tasting um, from all the way from the aperitivo to the dolce. Um, and we infused our food together and people really you know, had a great time. We're trying to connect the farmers and the producers and the co-producers together and so that we can have that relationship as well um, from India, from Shillong, from Meghalaya. Um, we had some, some um, exchange there um, to China, um, UNESCO as well. Some, some um, um, great things happen in Chengdu where we had the Slow Food Congress and we're gonna have the Congress again next year at Terra Madre in, in Italy in October. And here um, in Chengdu, we toured the, the gastronomy and also learning about hospitality that are thousands of years old. And so as we teach in DCAA and Dinner Community Advocacy Alliance, we're also talking about servant leadership. How do we teach each other how to survive? But beyond that, even though we're hurting, how do we serve one another to thrive? We're learning how to serve one another. We're truly learning that. And I think it's important as an aspect of public health, joy, and justice, and servant leadership is critical and important to, to our survival. Because that brings something in Dinet that we call sehasin, that means hope. That's a huge area of who we are, and it should be one of the critical um, areas that we address in public health. So, in closing, I wanted to share a couple of um, different resources with you, um, but as we see here, 
we have to remember as we celebrate this event and know, you know who we are and where we're coming from and the resilience and the strength, the courage, um, thinking about our families, thinking about where we come from and thinking about where we're going, it's important to know as we explore different areas across the world, get to know the local people, get to know the local food, get to know who we really are. And, and, and I don't know if you guys know of our um, comedians, um, James and Ernie from Navajo. And how many of you know them? Yeah, they're cool. Look them up, they're hilarious. I was with Ernie recently and Ernie says, there's always someone that comes up to you, a non-indigenous person comes up to you and asks, um, do you still eat buffalo? And, and in our culture, the, the, the comedian, he's a medicine man because he's a healer. As indigenous people, we love to laugh. We love to make fun of ourselves. We love to make fun of each other. And that's a way of, of how we gain our strength. And he said, there's always a non-indigenous person that comes up. And it happened to me last two weeks ago in New York City. <laughs> This lady comes up, I spoke at Food Tank, comes up and says, hi, I'm so glad to meet an indigenous person in, in New York City, and do you guys still eat buffalo? So Ernie said, this is what we're supposed to say, yes, we do, we eat the wings with blue cheese and ranch. <laughs> but the narrative here is that we have a lot of work to do. And then and he said, the other thing that people ask and come up to you and say, do you still um, use teepees? He goes, yeah, we use toilet paper. It's like, <laughs> And so as we're talking about the narrative, we're talking about you know, these stories and how do people view us as indigenous people, there's all kinds of interpretations as we're um, learning from Reclaiming Native Truth, right? Illuminatives. Have you guys been following that? Follow that and get involved in the work. And it's, it's very important as we see First Nations Development Institute and Crystal Echo Hawk um, lead this. And um, it, it's such a joy to do what we're doing. It's hard work, but keep continuing. Just like James and Ernie, they always have a joke. They always have a way of going forward. Um, don't forget to buy your copy of our recently um, released anthology. And this came out in August. And you can find it on Amazon. Um, if you Google the title and, and get your copy, because when we're talking about the future of food, when we're talking about who we are, um, the, a lot of the stories are being shared, storytelling now, and who we, um, who, what our identity is, and regaining health, and, and also reclaiming um, our ancestral ways. It's something important, so the people that I've mentioned, um, that are in this book, um, Chef Sean Sherman, Chef Brian Yazi, um, Elizabeth Hoover, um, Winona LaDuke, and myself, and many great others, Rowan White, um, as a seed saver. Please get your copy of this because it's important to learn from one another and also to celebrate one another. So in that, um, I'm, I'm here for any questions that you may have. Um, and if there's anything that I have missed, um, of course, this each policy and um, every area of the work has its own story, has its own process, but I'm really honored and grateful to be here and to share with you, and I hope I can have some seafood, and if you have any insights or any recommendations, uh, please let us know. And in other words, um, I'd like to say a hihat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janisa. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions and answers. We're um, going to pull up a slide about how to do the Q&A session. So we're actually using an online platform called Pigeonhole. So if you go to your phone or laptop, if you have that handy, you can go to www.pigeonhole.at. And the password is Denisa Livingston, and you can type in your question, and then we will ask it up here. So that's how we're doing question and answers. Um, so our first question for Denisa is, your enthusiasm is inspiring. How do you maintain such positivity despite many of the challenges you encounter? Anonymous to you. <laughs> um, that, that is a, a, a good question. I, 
I believe it's all of a personal journey. We get to that point where you just had enough and you start to do something about what's not right. And when you go through the process and, and go through those challenges, each challenge is an opportunity. The harder it is, and my uncle said, um, the one that is um, addressing the uranium contamination issue since he was a child, um, and our family has been in this work, he says, Shiaje, that means my dear, the greatest work and the hardest work is the best work. If you have the most challenging piece of legislation, that is the best work. I never understood that because we would cry. We, we went through so much to go through the work that, we've, that we were doing, and I did not understand, like, how, how do we overcome this? How do we talk to our tribal leaders? And all these questions came, you know, that we could not answer at that time. But as we went through and traveled through these valleys and hills and the plateaus and, and, and the mountains of everything that we've done, we began to see the new perspectives. We began to see what should have been uncovered, that these problems have answers, that those prayers, they provide the solutions, that everything that we were doing and uncovering that no one wanted to touch, we began to see that new growth of something that was awakening and alive and becoming joyful. So that process is learning from one another, encouraging yourself and looking in the mirror and not seeing a kitty, but seeing a lion, right? It's, it's looking at those things and allowing you, know, you to be you and, and to be the authentic you, not the copy of someone else. That, that is a very critical point that, um, that I always wake up with that, you know, I'm just like you. I see the alarm clock, hear the alarm clock, like, oh, we gotta wake up. No, you gotta talk to yourself, you gotta get up, it's gonna be a good day, it's gonna, you know, you're gonna resonate, you know, you're gonna be a powerful being in this, you know, presence in this space, you're, you're already power, you gotta speak yourself up. You, you, we don't have any other choice. If we look to other choices, then we're not gonna be our best self. Thank you. Okay, next question. Have you had pushback from community members on favorite foods being taxed? Yes, great question. So one of the, the pushback that we've, that we've had is that who are you to tax us, right? Um, that we don't have a choice, but we had to do a lot of awareness that the 2% um, is an unhealthy foods tax, a friendly awareness tax. So the way that we, we word things, the way that we um, recognize the work and the way that we display and communicate that was really important. So when we were starting to say junk food tax, it had a lot of negative connotation. People did not want to be in that space because they knew that they had an addiction or that they're suffering, that they, we didn't want to put them in that space and place. And so when we changed the Title II Healthy Dinner Nation Act and started to share images and also talk, talk about the process of what would be done with the, um, the funds and how that would be utilized, they began to understand, okay, I get it. But it was not something that we were pressing on them that, you know, that, that we were challenging them, is that they, we in, in interpreted for them that they could be a part of the process of, of allowing this vehicle, the Healthy Dinner Nation Act, to be a tool to open up the discussions like that and to feel um, brave enough to, to talk about it. So we get a lot of text messages like, I bought my chips and candy, and they show us a picture of their receipt. I made a contribution to community wellness projects, but that never happened before. But now they know, they know that, you know, that there's a tax, but also we wanted them to be informed too to be a, a educated uh, public that when they go to the register, they can say if they have a bottle of water, they can ask the cashier, is there a tax or no tax? So they want to ensure that they're not being taxed, but if they have an unhealthy food tax too, they're gonna say, what is the tax? And they're also looking at the receipts now, whereas they weren't looking at the receipts before. So it, it was a big process, but of course, I mean, there's pushback every which way. Thank you. The next question, can you tell us something about the healthy food supply chains within and to the Diné Nation and whether they have changed since the tax laws were enacted in 2014 and 15? I think that's in reference to the retailers who whoever asked this question, I'm assuming. So the retailers and, and, and their, their um, participation um, and whether that they have changed. Um, I want to recognize Bash's, Bash's grocery store, because they were the first um, uh, company to come out to us and say, we want to be in compliance from day one. So what we did with our team, um, we scanned every item that should be tax and non-tax in Bash's and Windrock, and then they activated that in other Bash's. 
because when we're dealing with partial compliance, there are companies there that are being paid by corporations to continue to serve unhealthy food and drinks. And so these companies now are being a part of, of, of community and also having more food you know, demos in the grocery stores or having the food tastings. Um, the fresh fruits and vegetable prescription is also activated. So some of our, um, our patients will receive a prescription for fresh fruits and vegetables. They'll take that to the C store or the, the, um, the local store and get their produce. Um, and so there's now that partnership that is happening. What we want to do is increase um, that communication between the producer and um, the retailer so that we know that there's an access to healthy food when it becomes, um, when it pertains to the unhealthy um, food tax and also the, the tax-free healthy food. So in both ways, whether we're trying to gain their support to have more healthy food or even to um, negotiate, you know, what they're selling in their stores, but it's becoming a process. But we see the change. Um, the signs um, that we've created, you can see them online as well as on Facebook. We've created some community signs about the laws. Um, we're asking the stores to also post that so that people are aware. Um, we know that we have to introduce legislation to be posting signs like that, but we're doing a lot of um, um, awareness around that and helping our community members to, to be informed and also to get to know their grocery store. So instead of, um, we did some, some tours in the stores to, to show what tax are non-taxable and uh, we, we connected them to the manager and said, if you want kale, if you want um, bok choy, if you want these different foods, please ask the manager. Don't go you know, to Albuquerque or Phoenix and say, oh, I, they don't have it here. No, tell them what, they, what you want, what, what you like to see. So we see a lot of that happening now in the conversation, knowing that they have ownership there. Okay, next question. How do the taxes work on border towns for which the Tribal Council has less control over? So for this, we know that the Tribal Council was worried about bootlegging unhealthy food. And we know that that happens, not even on the local level, but we know the millions of dollars that's being um, spent by Tribal Council off the reservation, off the nation. And this is something that we're addressing that it cannot only be just the people, you know, being told that they need to localize their purchases, but also tribal government. How do we activate that together? And so instead of separating, you know, who's doing what, how do we activate and know that when we're purchasing together um, um, and also from each other that it, that it will grow our economy in a healthier way, but also we're looking at systems that, that will um, incentivize and also help and support the retailers um, that are local. So for example, if folks are looking for like the Navajo churro lamb or the, the chilchen, um, the sumac berries, that they'll be able to go online and actually see which um, retailer or even indigenous um, retailer um, has the products or who that they can buy it from, or even the producer, the local producer, that they'll be able to, to have that system. And so it's been um, quite a process in communicating um, about this topic, but also looking forward to the sustainability of, of working towards food sovereignty on Navajo. Next question, where obesity is a term that means overweight, which implies a normative weight goal, what measures have you implemented to avoid moral indictments of fatness, which we know lead to systemic bias? So different measures on that. I know that um, the Tribal Council was concerned about the terms and talking about this because it's very sensitive. Um, we try to be more sensitive in the words that we're using. Um, we've even been criticized by organizations, um, national health organizations, about even using you know different terms. But when it came to what the community members wanted to use, they said, we, we have to call it for what it is. Um, and they were comfortable in, in using different terms, but as well as using like James and Ernie, when they tell their stories that they're able to talk about themselves. And um, Ernie really had a powerful story when he was talking about being in wrestling when he was in school. He said, wrestling's not for indigenous people because we're overweight. He's like, he said, you know, I look like a bumblebee when I was in, in my uniform. And when we talk about ourselves, and, and especially for him, because we were at a health, um, event and him talking about this issue, it was very important, but not only that, is that we don't have to be so 
um, complicated in the information. It, we have to step out and, and, and remove ourselves from, from knowing the sensitivity about um, what we're saying here, but also knowing that um, our community members know that we respect them. That, that what we're doing is for the outcome and for, for their health, that what we're talking about is not to offend them, it's also to, but it's, all, but it's really to grow us, it's to heal us and to empower us. So it's that trust um, relationship that, um, that we step into when, it talk, when we're talking about these terms and terminology. It's, it's such a process. Thank you. Last question from Rose. How can other tribal communities adopt a junk food tax? Is that the first person we had their name listed? I think the last one we had was Alex, too, but all the rest were anonymous. OK, Alex and Rose, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> we have some um, coasters that are made um, from our ladies. Um, and also, you'll get some swag. So come see me after. Um, the last question, how do we adopt a junk food tax? So. Based on our experience, it's been quite difficult, but what we're really trying to promote is that we can simplify the work. So for example, um, chips, soda, and candy um, taxation. Um, um, other tribes have come to us and wanted to do a tax, um, um, an executive order to ban tribal funding on soda. So there are different ways of doing the tax, but I know there's about a handful of tribal communities that are actually doing work. So when we're talking about consultation and advising and um, webinars, we're going through what we've been through, the laws and the policies, the definitions of unhealthy food and healthy food, and helping them to understand what they need to do because it is something that we see in, 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 in Indian, Indian country um, that these stores are heavily right it inventoried with unhealthy food and so when we're talking about the this importation um we should also be questioning the regulation if there's regulations i mean if we're you know sovereign communities and we should be practicing um these ways of what we actually allow onto our our land and into our bodies and so lots of discussion is happening, and I shared a lot of things at the luncheon um, that some folks did not know, you know, the underground work of this because, you know, we risk our lives to be addressing these issues. And so um, it's very important, you know, that, that we continue to learn about these different ways of, of addressing taxation and also creating income, um, economic development, um, but also addressing um, healthy food access. Um, and so with your work and with your um, support. Um, we should continue the conversations. I don't know what happens as an outcome. Those of you that are interested, um, we could have a webinar. We could, you know, have you know a Q another Q and A. Um, I'm available. Our, our advocates, Mr. Simpson, um, please pick his brain too because he's a leader that we cannot lose. He's a leader that we need at the table uh, at these conversations. So that's that is um, all I have to share. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for Denisa? Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Allison Barlow for closing remarks. Denisa, thank you so much. Uh, you're a public health warrior. You really are. And we gain so much inspiration from you. We're so grateful. Um, we talk about our school being the first school, the largest school of public health in the world. And it's so obvious that's not true. It's so obvious that our indigenous brothers and sisters are the originators of the true meaning of public health. And so we thank you for educating us today and your continued warriorship for um, expanding that education to all of us. Um, don't let Native American Heritage Month be your time to think about indigenous peoples and their knowledge. We are all interrelated and sharing this knowledge with the world we know is what will heal our planet. Um, so be advocates in your own right for um, lifting up indigenous peoples and their knowledge that is critical um, to our earth and to our planet. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce Sean to um, close this out. Before I do that, I want to tell you something that's kind of interesting. And that is, we were really excited to have a caterer today that would cater um, indigenous foods from this area. And the caterer has had an emergency. 
and cannot be here. And I think I've learned from my indigenous teachers that there's a reason for that. Uh, we don't know what it is, but I think we want to join in our prayers together for them and, and hoping them the very best. Um, but in the meantime, I guess our food will be our company um, when we leave here. And so there will still be in the atrium afterwards with beverages, tea, and lemonade, and um, our, each other's company to nourish us. So with that, Sean, if we could um, ask for you to do the closing. Yeah.